For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. From the 43rd and 44th verses of the 19th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, for perspective, last week we heard of the great mercy of God in forgiving the lost sinner who had repented in time. And he was forgiven all and brought into new life in God. And this time, today, one week later, we remember the fall of a nation that Jesus pronounced desolate because it knew not the time of its visitation. The time for repentance had come and gone and was not even recognized. And in Matthew's Gospel, 23rd chapter, same event is is recorded where Jesus says that because they knew not the time of their visitation, Israel's house was left unto it desolate. So there is a judgment. There is a righteous condemnation of those who do not repent. But there is all forgiveness and grace and goodness and light and peace and restoration and resurrection and joy in God forever to those who recognize his visitation and repent in time and believe. So let's look at somewhat of the lessons that we can find in this terrible pronouncement of judgment against those who failed to watch and pray and see the time of their visitation. Remember, first of all, that one of the pitfalls that Christians face when they look at this gospel is that they tend to enter into self-righteous judgment. Oh, those people failed and were destroyed, but not me. I'm safe. I'm on the inside. That is not a righteous judgment. It is a very foolish one because as long as we're in this life, we're in temptation and we too can fall away. Not by God's work. We can always, the devil is always there to make us refuse the good work that God has begun in us. And so, as Paul says in Galatians 6.1, have a spirit of meekness, lest thou also be tempted. And as Jesus said in Luke 13.3, speaking of those who perished because of their sins, he says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And as Paul warned us in Romans 11, 19 and 20, thou wilt say, the branches, that is, Israel, the branches of the vine, were broken off, that I might be grafted in. And Paul says, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded. Now, the Lord is long-suffering to us, and he will not, is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's Second Peter 3, 9. And whatever the people in the time of our Lord who represented the nation of Israel at that time may have done and what, they, what failure they may have incurred in judgment as a result of that failure, there are plenty of people today that are on the brink of making the same mistake, and we must not be judgmental toward them, but rather pray that their eyes may yet be open while there is still time, while they're still alive in this life, and mine may find mercy and repentance and forgiveness and restoration and regeneration and salvation. So, the word that Jesus uses, which was the turning point for the Pharisees and the people of Jerusalem in those days, was this. Visitation. He didn't say, you missed your calling. He said, you didn't know the time of your visitation. What's visitation? That's when somebody comes to meet you and see you with a message. 
And they had no concept of that happening. Well, why, why did they miss this? God visited to save and redeem. He said in Matthew 20, 28, Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many. And as John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, prophesied at the birth of, time of the birth of John the Baptist, God has God visited and redeemed his people and raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David. That's one of the canticles that is sometimes that is authorized to be used at morning prayer in the place where we usually sing the Tedeum. But it's a great statement from an Old Testament believer that God had visited and redeemed his people and raised up salvation in the house of his servant David. What a prophetic statement. Redemption and salvation, the very things that the Pharisees had no use for. Now this shows you why they missed their visitation because they weren't looking for anybody to redeem and save them even though Zacharias, the high priest at that time, was. But the rest of the Pharisees were not. They didn't want a redeemer and a savior. They thought they were righteous. Remember the parable that Jesus told of the publican and the Pharisee supposedly at prayer in the temple? The Pharisee didn't pray at all, but he boasted that he was righteous. He never asked for mercy or forgiveness. And that was the trouble. The Pharisees had worked it out that the religion that they were to pass on, practice and pass on to others in their time was a religion of waiting for a Messiah, which they presumed to be a king born out of their own people who would fight all their battles for them, would essentially lift them up out of the mire and the dust of subjugation as they were at that time under Rome and bring victory and affirm them not call them to repent and not be a sin offering for them they didn't want anything to do with that they weren't looking for that so when someone came in that character as Jesus said he did and spoke openly of it as we just heard they didn't want it they didn't look for that to come I didn't recognize it as anything to do with them. They were here waiting for a king that would set them up and justify them in their present condition and put everybody else down in the world. That's what they were waiting for. No wonder they missed the visitation. They had replaced it in their mind with something entirely worldly. That's what happened. They look for a human king. That's the same fault that God found in them when they said to Samuel, we don't want all of this, you know, telling us what God said and what we should do. We want a king. The other countries in the world have kings and we want one like they have. He'll fight all our battles for us. They didn't want religion. They wanted a political kingdom. That was the difference. And Samuel was grieved and told the Lord about it. And the Lord said, they're not rebelling against you, Samuel. They're rebelling against me. But give them a king and we'll see where it goes. That's essentially what happened. He gave them a king. And in that kingly line came Jesus. And they didn't want him because he didn't have the character of what they meant by a king. He came to be a redeemer. Israel's purpose and ours was and is to receive and bring forth Christ, the Savior of all the world. They didn't know anything about bringing forth a Redeemer to the world. And yet that was their purpose. You can find it all through their scriptures. We needn't take a whole lot of time, but cite a few of them. Genesis twenty-two eighteen: 18. And thy seed, said God to Abraham, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And Paul explains in Galatians 3.16 that that promise was made to Abraham and his seed singular. And that one seed is Christ. And then as he said in Galatians 3.29, if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed. And you're therefore an heir to the promises made to Abraham. Because those promises descend to Christ. And you are in Christ. 
And they don't descend to a blood descendant, but to all his spiritual descendants by faith. They may include his blood descendants, some of them. They certainly include many more others that were not such. Psalm 86 says, All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Isaiah 11.10 says, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Who was Jesse? Jesse was the father of King David. And that's the royal line that was established. There shall be a root. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So the Gentiles are called to this king, descendant of Jesse. That's through the line of David. Isaiah 49, 6, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. What were the Pharisees doing about this? Their own prophets told them that they were to bring forth a Messiah for all the countries and peoples of the world. Isaiah 55, 5, Thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. And Isaiah 60, verse 3, The Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. And for all this, the Pharisees had stopped their ears and blinded their eyes. Still, and I'm quoting from their book, Paul explains it in Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. All right, so that's settled. Now, the Pharisees missed it because they were looking for an earthly king and had no use for a redeemer king for a sin offering because they had no sense of sin. They considered themselves righteous and other sinners. Remember that parable? He didn't confess his sins and ask for mercy, that Pharisee. He only boast, boasted of his righteousness. So what effect should Jesus Christ's visitation have had on Israel? First of all, he was in Israel at the time. And we see by his spirit of self-sacrifice, mortifying the flesh, crucifying the flesh with the affections and lusts in his own sinless body for others for the love of you and me he did this this is what Jesus took on as his duty and his followers took on the same character the same spirit of self-sacrificing love and reiterated it in their lives and repented of anything that was contrary to that spirit this is what they did and we can see this. First of all, look at his, look at his spirit as is portrayed in Isaiah 53. Now Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50, the Lord, uh, verses 5 to 7, The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious. This is Christ Jesus speaking to the prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah writing it down. And Jesus says, The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious nor turned away back. But I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from the shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, shall I not be confounded. Therefore, have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. That should have been enough. But listen to what he says in Isaiah 53. And this is it's so long. I'll shorten it. But it refers to verses 4 through 12, surely he, meaning the Messiah, the Christ, even the Hebrews believe that this refers to the Messiah. As we all know, it refers to Christ. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, not his, but ours. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, that is the penalty that it took to make peace between us and God, that's the chastisement of our peace, was upon him, not upon the guilty party, you and me. And with his stripes, we were healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall bear their iniquities, and he bear the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. My goodness, look at all of that. Do you know that there are some teachers in Israel today that call this 53rd chapter of Isaiah the forbidden chapter? Because you can't read it without seeing Jesus Christ very strongly and heavily in it. And they don't want that. First of all, they don't want to be visited by their king in the, in the character of a sin offering. Because that means that we're all sinners and we need a sin offering to be redeemed from it. Otherwise, we're doomed to destruction. That's what it means. And that's why Jesus is so hated. Because he brings that truth out. There's only one way out of destruction. It's by his death for you and me taking our sins upon him as our perfect sin offering. It's there all put together in Isaiah 53, if nowhere else. And so what effect did this have on the apostles? Very clear. They turned as a lamb to the slaughter. They left behind their old self-righteous, self-justifying, headstrong, self-willed character that they were full of. There was Saul, the great terror of Christian believers, believed that he was doing God service when he set about to restrain them, arrest them, beat them, and kill them. He was a liberal terror to all Christians until he was turned around and shown his error. And he thought it was God that was telling him to do this. But that was corrected. And Peter was known for his ability to blurt out almost anything because he was sort of an alpha personality. And if others were quiet, he wasn't going to be quiet. He spoke. Sometimes he was right on target when he called Jesus the son of God, savior of the world. But he was way off when he said, you're not going to have to go to the cross. And Jesus cursed him for that and called him Satan. But Peter and his worst failure was both boasting that he would go to prison and to death for Jesus. And then actually turning around and doing the opposite and verbally denying that he even knew him when Jesus was in trouble with the authorities. And so he, his heart was broken, as was Saul's heart broken. And he turned around and he became an entirely different character. If we read what they wrote about the Christian life and the Christian way of life, it's like the difference between night and day, especially Peter's epistles. It's not the same person, you'll say, as the one that was so full of himself and so boastful and so blustering and yet so blundering at the same time. There's none of that in his epistles. You say, could it be the same person? Listen to some of these things that were written and see if you can put it together. In Paul, in Romans chapter 20, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, we have These words and to for he starts out saying let love be without dissimulation in verse 10 be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another rejoicing in hope patient in hospital and tribulation continuing instant in prayer distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality listen to this Verse 14, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Doesn't that seem like if you have, you come up against somebody that looks hostile to you, 
isn't it natural for human nature to re to be repulsed by that and to have a mind that is verging on cursing the person, at least finding fault with them? And don't you think they can read that in you? The devil sure can. But St. Paul says, do the opposite. Are you surprised when they lash out at you because they can read your mind? That you're not, you're not liking what you see? But you should come at them this way, as he says. He says, bless them which persecute you. That's even worse than just looking ugly and contrary. They curse, persecute you. Bless and curse not. And you should pray for them, as Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel in the Sermon on the Mount. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. We should treat one another, even though the other person doesn't always seem to deserve it. But be of that same mind towards them that we have towards God. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Here we go again. Recompense no man evil for evil. If that person is being evil to you, don't return it. If possible, live as, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved brethren, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's Paul's testimony of the change that was wrought in him because of his encounter with Jesus Christ, his Savior and his Redeemer. Now let's look at what happened to St. Peter and the change that was made in him. First of all, first of all, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he picks out the greatest example that we can find in what Jesus did for us and says that's to be our example. And that starts in verse 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now Peter suffered rightfully because he was broken in his heart and smitten in his spirit when he saw himself denying his Lord whom he had just sworn that he would go die for and go to prison for and sees himself now denying him. And that was bread broke his heart. But he says, you should suffer, you should endure grief, suffering wrongfully. That is suffering where you don't deserve it, even from other people, not even from your own wrongs, but wrongfully. Peter deserved the heartbreaking that he got because it was his own fault. But Peter is saying, you should be the repentant even towards those who make you suffer when you didn't deserve it. Why? Because, and that's in verse 20, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it and take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. 21, for, meaning because, even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So he starts out saying, Christ suffered wrongfully for you and me, and we should therefore walk in his footsteps and be willing to suffer insults that we don't deserve for his sake because he did this for us. And he translates that into our relations with other people in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. And he ends up saying, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Isn't that the very opposite of the character that Peter showed in his time before he was converted? Be clothed with humility. There is his word to us. And he who knows what it is delight to, to, to offend God by having the contrary spirit knows whereof he speaks when he gives that powerful advice to us and then in chapter 5 
verses 5 to 7 of Peter's first epistle. He says this, Younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The change between Peter before his conversion and after his conversion are so starkly presented in the contrast between Peter as he appears in the Gospels and Peter as he appears in his own epistle written after his conversion. And God, bring us to the same. The other apostle who joins in this same essential, the same message is John in his first epistle, verse chapter 1, verse 8, that famous epistle that says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And yet he's the one who didn't have to go through this heartbreaking repentance that Peter and, Peter and Paul did. Surely, as a sensitive Christian soul, he was too heartbroken in recognizing that Jesus died for his sins. And he says in, in um, 1 John 3, 3, Every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, Jesus, is pure. So we have, and he sets before us our duty to examine and purge ourselves of sin to receive Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Savior. And he says finally in verse 16 of chapter 3, 1 John, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So these apostles showed what it is to know the time of your visitation and to live in the spirit of the one who visited the Redeemer, the Savior. back at the Pharisees they didn't want any of this they flatly rejected all of it they were for self-justification Luke 16 verse 15 Jesus said directly to them ye are they which justify yourselves and Romans 10 3 Paul says for they that is the Pharisees and all the non-believing Jews of his day they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Romans 10.3 So, let us not fall into that same error. Let us pray to the Lord God to keep us from falling into that old error. Not because it was just the Pharisees' error, but because it is the ingrained predisposition of human nature. And you and I are born with that nature and are struggling with it and against it all the days of our life until our last breath. And there's always a chance that it will try to put its ugly head forward again, even after having been shamed and disciplined and brought to a good and true faith in Jesus. The temptation will never go, completely go away to assert self and be justified by self. And we'll find it, surprisingly or not, we will find it in many of our own habitual and customary ways so full of self-confidence, self-justification, and self-righteousness, self-approval. This is the old man which said no at the first visitation of Jesus. If we love him, we will submit to his spirit. And if we do, if we do that, he will beget his new spirit in us, and he calls it being born again. He calls it being a new creature created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's Paul's statement of it in Ephesians 2.10. In fact, he says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And then what are those good works? The fruits of the Spirit. 
as enumerated in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit. And Thomas Cranmer, as we've noted before, truthfully said that these are not the fruits of man, but the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, meaning self-control. Against such there is no law. And this is that to which we are drawn and should make our prayer to be given grace to come to. Let this be the outward and visible evidence among us that we have in truth known the time of our visitation, that we have within us the spirit of Jesus Christ as made known to us in his life and death for us and in the lives of and martyrdom of his apostles who underwent a visible change of character when they received his spirit. Lord God, let us know the time of thy visitation. Bring thy spirit upon us to work in us thy good will and to bring to fruition all thy gifts to honor thee who gave thy life for us. Thy son Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Oh,